This is Jim Janesey, and we're now taking a look at Chapter 23 of The Story of Art by Ernst Gombrich. This chapter covers a period that overlaps the end of the Baroque, and it focuses on England and France. We're going to be taking a look at a genre of art developed by William Hogarth, whose ambitions to be a painter were frustrated by the lack of appreciation in England at the time for local artists. We'll also take a look at some examples of portraiture by Reynolds, Gainsborough, and Lawrence. And finally, we'll wind up on history painting. The Baroque in England was rather subdued. Here we have an example of architecture of the English Baroque. This is St. Paul's Cathedral in London. You'll notice it has a number of the Baroque-style features, doubled columns, this appearance of a Greek temple, and these towers that begin square and end up round and exhibit a broken entablature here. On the interior, these churches were much more subdued in terms of decoration than the Italian Baroque. Here we really don't see any color. We see features that are just on the surface of a white interior, but we don't see any statuary or pictures. This was really designed more to be a meeting hall than a place that would overwhelm and dazzle. British gardens also differed from the types of gardens surrounding magnificent palaces such as Versailles. They took their inspiration from some of the paintings of Claude Lorraine from a hundred years earlier, and they usually included some type of a classical element, as in this case this little reproduction here of a uh, Greek temple. William Hogarth was an artist who lived during the early part of the 1700s. He was rather frustrated because at the time the buying public, that is, the aristocrats who bought art, didn't appreciate local artists nearly as much as they appreciated some of the old masters from the rest of Europe, Italy primarily. Hogarth invented a genre of art called moralistic art. He was an accomplished painter and engraver, and he realized the buying public wouldn't be too interested in paintings that he might come up with unless they served a purpose that seemed to be large on the minds of many people. What was the purpose of this painting? So he came up with a purpose, and the purpose was to show what happens to somebody who acts badly or acts unwisely as a younger person and how they end up in ruin. So he created a character called the Rake, and this is Tom Rake. This illustration is different than the one in the Gombrich textbook because, in fact, Gombrich illustrates only one of the eight paintings in this series, and I have included here the paintings, but then also the engravings that were later made from them. And it turns out Hogarth was much more successful with the engravings than with the paintings. And you'll notice if you compare the paintings to the engravings, the engravings usually introduce more of a sinister character. The people are a little bit uglier, and the scene sometimes has additional things in it that would contribute to the point that uh, Hogarth is trying to make. So if you look through these, you'll see, with the little annotations at the bottom, the whole story of the rake's progress. And I'll just quickly flip through these. But you see, the young man who inherits money when his father dies manages to squander it, winds up in a very bad way, gets a young lady in trouble, but she's the only one who remains faithful to him. Here's a good example of how things are made more sinister in the engravings. Here's the painting of uh, Tom escaping arrest as the girl that he has wronged pays his debt and rescues him from debtor's prison. But notice in the engraving, it's made much more sinister by lightning in the sky and in the lower left corner, a crowd in a rather bad state, whereas in the original painting there was nothing in that corner. The whole point of this series of engravings was moralistic. Don't be like Tom, or you'll end up as badly as he does. Here, Tom is trying to marry an old widow who has some money because his fortunes are really kind of fallen on hard times. And then here we have Tom in a gambling den, and now we have Tom in debtor's prison. And finally, we have the painting that uh, Gombrich illustrates, the end of Tom's life in an insane asylum, where a number of the people pictured here are representative of uh, various types of uh, insanity. And Tom is dying, and the only people left with him, aside from the other people in the insane asylum, is Sarah Young, the woman that he wronged. A number of tales of virtue and vice are wrapped up in this series. The important thing to remember is that, at this point, for Hogarth's paintings to be accepted by the buying public in England, they had to serve a purpose besides being high art, because they weren't regarded as high art. They were regarded as a moralistic genre of art. 
Here we have a comparison of a few portrait artists in the late 1700s in England. Joshua Reynolds was more or less the dean of this school of portrait artists, and here it had become fashionable again to paint a portrait of a person illustrating something about their occupation. So here is a scholar, Joseph Moretti, who had composed a dictionary of English and Italian, and he's shown rather nearsighted reading a book. Reynolds had a real talent for bringing out the character of a person. Here's a very young child that he was asked to paint. The story is told how he prepared the emotions for a painting like this by becoming familiar with the child, going to dinner at their house, playing little tricks, and then the next morning the, uh, the girl was very happy to see him, and he posed this painting with a little dog, and it came out in a very lovely way, illustrating something of her character and the fact that she's so happy actually to be there. Gainsborough, on the other hand, didn't follow the same kinds of rules that Reynolds would like to lay down. In fact, we'll see an example of a clear violation of one of the rules that Reynolds had come up with. But in this case, we have a rather interesting portrait here. This is not in your book. This portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews kind of reveals something about Gainsborough. He really would have rather been painting landscapes, but portraits are what sold. So in this case, he managed to convince this newlywed couple that a good portrait of them would be something that also showed the lands that they owned. I mean, if you take a look at this, actually more than half the painting is dominated by that landscape, and the people who first commissioned the portrait actually are rather minor figures in that painting. So it's rather clever on Gainsborough's part. Uh, Gainsborough was not brought up in the same way with the learned background that Reynolds was, but he was also a very accomplished portrait painter. Now here we have something that Gainsborough painted that's not in the, the Gombrich textbook either, and this is Blue Boy. The reason that this was painted this way was in clear violation of one of Reynolds' rules that blue really should serve as a background color and should never be used as the color for the main object in the portrait and to flaunt his violation of that when Gainsborough painted this portrait he purposely had the young man dress in blue and he made the background brown. An interesting thing about this I'm going to compare it to another painting that also is not in the textbook. Here we have another artist not mentioned in the book Sir Thomas Lawrence who was also an accomplished portraitist at this time. Here is a portrait that's named Pinky. It's actually this young lady Sarah Moulton Barrett. The portrait is really a very interesting one. She's looking at us in a very inquisitive way. We know now from having analyzed the painting with x-rays that Lawrence actually tried out variations of those flowing ribbons from her hat and what comes about at this point in a rather breezy sort of a flowing way and the line of her arm kind of echoes in the symmetrical way the way that that one ribbon is hanging down. It adds to the charm of the painting. Well, here's the interesting part of the story. These paintings now face one another in the Huntington Gallery in uh, Southern California, and I thought it was rather interesting that uh, they were placed that way. She's at one end of the gallery and he's at the other end, and they're looking at each other. Interestingly enough, the Huntington Gallery lets you take pictures. As long as you don't take a flash, which might damage in the long run the paintings, you can actually take pictures yourself. So I was the one who shot these two pictures. Here we have a genre of art also developing in the 1700s. The fact that just ordinary scenes might be worthy of being painted. So here we have just a mother serving some food to two of her children. It's nothing really too noteworthy about it. It's a much more subdued scene than you might have seen in earlier days by painters who originated the peasant genre like Bruegel. Here there's very little action going on. But it's reached the point where at least Chardon thought that this was worthy of being painted and that it would actually be accepted as art. And finally we come to an example of what we might call historical painting, that is a painting painted for the purpose of documenting a scene. So this is actually attempting to document, as a snapshot might, what was going on at the time that some event was occurring in the past that was worthwhile to be noted, that was worthwhile to preserve for posterity. So this is in the form of a historical painting, another genre that developed at the time as a rationale for the creation of the painting.